If you don't ask questions, I'll ask you questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the, 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 it was sometimes a little difficult to follow without having all these uh, mechanisms uh, present. But uh, so, might be a stupid question, but what did these PC1 and PC2 access do? And so, let's see if I can give a coherent... Are we still filming me? I'm going to be on the internet trying to describe principal components analysis uh, from a classics point of view. No, essentially, what we're doing is we're taking a multi-dimensional feature space and we're simply rotating it so that the maximum variance occurs um, in the x-axis of our graph. So if you imagine... What's a good way to look at it? Correct me if I make a mistake, but imagine a, a two-dimensional graph where your data tend to co-vary, so they make a diagonal line. And you, what you want to do is see the greatest degree of variation in one of your, either your vertical or horizontal axis. And the best way to achieve that is to turn it, like either turn it this way or turn it that way, so that you get a, a, a sausage this way. Does that make sense? And you just do the same thing in 8,000 dimensions. Um, that's my understanding, but I'm not a mathematician, so forgive me if I, if I get it wrong. Does anyone want to correct me or say that, th that this is right? Essentially, it means that, so we started with 8,000 variables. Each was the frequency of a particular word. And in the, after we do the rotation, we haven't changed the positions of these points relative to each other. We've changed them relative to where we're viewing them from. And the x-axis now is a formula in terms of those 8,000 original variables. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the best I can do. <laughs> Any more hands? So uh, we had actually a nice introduction from um, Chesco this evening uh, for students for a general introduction to this topic, so okay. text mining so in general. And uh, he explained to us, because I'm also not uh, an expert in your topic, so I'm more from the yeah, spatial analysis side, um, that uh, you will show us a kind of element, uh, evaluation method. Uh, so this is just one hypothesis, how you can evaluate your results. Is it, uh, yeah, did I understand it right? Or is Maybe. I think, I mean, it, to speak frankly, I think that um, one thing that is needed here is a more concrete method of evaluating the success. I think what we really need to do here, um, first of all, at the, at the biggest scale, in terms, of the, in terms of the final results, what we need to do is specify beforehand, these are the things we want to see in our results, these are the things we want to exclude, then do the experiment and say how many of the ones you wanted to catch do you catch? How many of the ones to exclude are you excluding? That's something that will require more uh, work by hand from the beginning. This is really a sort of exploratory mode right now where we do the digital work first and then that points us to a reading, but to really evaluate it in the, most, in the strictest sense, we need to define ahead of time what success and failure are in very specific terms mm -hmm. and then compare that. So that's one place that we will go as we get more human entered data. Does that make sense? As a yeah. benchmark. Yeah. At the same time, um, the individual components of it can be evaluated uh, for success and failure. So I showed you some, some images where we have the data points colored according to authorship and we visually inspect it and say the author seems separated or they're not so separated. Um, I, have some, I have an appendix of slides we cut. Here is another way that we can evaluate that where we actually, for each classification, compare it to the true authorship and get a score between zero and one, how well does this agree with authorship? Um, and then you see the variation among, this is TF, IDF, this was with LDA, um, and we see that, so zero means the, two, the, the computer un, unsupervised classification is no more associated with true authorship than chance Zero is chance in this case. Uh, one is they're perfectly aligned. And we see that with just TF-IDF, we can kind of put a number on, at least 
on average, how closely the classification accords with true authorship, which is something we don't want in this case. LDA is a lot lower, so we can say in this case, it's better. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, unfortunately, if you do LDA 100 times in a row with such tiny samples, it's not, it's not even related to itself all that well, which tells you it's not stable. Um, is that what, the kind of thing you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Likewise, for the number of clusters we used, I showed you an example with seven. This is what I was talking about. We ran it 10 times, uh, or maybe it was 15 in this case, and then we compare each pair of the, of the resulting clusters. So with five clusters, do it 10 different times, and then for every possible pair of them, do they agree or not? And you see that there's the, you get these like kind of local maxima here, which is just like maybe this is a more stable setting for the number of clusters. Um, this was the LDA stability. I don't want to show that, uh, but <laughs> it shows that it's really low. The, 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 de the degree to which successive runs of this agree with each other um, is, is, is low. Now, is that the kind of thing that you were asking about yeah. or, or not? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the truth is uh, we need more. But we are doing it. It's, it's just work in progress. It's work in progress, exactly. But that's, that's how we know what works and what doesn't, is by quantifying, first defining, and then testing, and quantifying success yeah. in each case. So we can be curious what comes next from your project. Yeah, I mean, I think two things. Uh, one is just we try a whole lot more of this. We try more combinations of parameters. We do more of these tests. And when something works, we pursue that, mm -hmm. right? Um, although you have to, at the same time, avoid tuning your classified to a specific case that's sort of over, um, overfitted. Mm -hmm. But I think what will probably be even more productive in the long run is to follow up on the uh, supervised um, classification, where we say ahead of time, this is, we were talking it over just before this, maybe this is a battle scene, this is a a voyage, a sea voyage. And we find examples of those from Virgil and from Statius and from everybody else. And we then put all of the sea voyages in one cluster. We put all of the, all of the battles in another one. And we tell the computer, find us the biggest difference you can between these two groups. Then we bring that back to the text and see for a set of scenes that we did not put into the training, how many does it get right? That's, I think, where we should go next, and ideally, we'll be able to talk to the, the guys doing the um, epigrams and, and maybe share some of our results there. Mm -hmm. So we've done work in the past with, like, say, uh, uh, support vector machines um, in terms of, of, of training and, and supervised learning. We might be able to do that again here. Mm -hmm. That's where I think we're going. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I, I assume that you can apply the same methodology to, say, action movies, and you will also find that the scenes where women are expressing concerns are more elegiac or more epic. Uh, so does that mean that these, uh, this distinction is somehow universal, or uh, does it make sense uh, to, to describe more or less everything we did, or is it, are, are these terms just given have a, and they have a long tradition? Um, is, is it somehow the, 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 the best way to classify the material you have? Or does that question make any sense? Yeah, it does. Um, don't let me steal the microphone from you, Lavinia, if you have something to add on the subject. Um, <coughs> yeah, I have a couple of, of different answers to that. The first is that um, one of the so one of the benefits of doing supervised classification is that we get what we're looking for. But one of the downfalls is that you get what you're looking for. And so when we come to this saying, show me elegy, and we have an idea of what that is already, that's what we're going to find if we find anything. What we were hoping for with the unsupervised classification is you say, here are a bunch of scenes from Epic now, computer, you divide this up. You find the bits that seem to be the most different from each other, the group together to the degree that, you know, to the maximum degree. And we're not telling it, look for this or that. Look for, we expect elegy, we expect arming and naval scenes and all the rest. If we 
especially if we go to the detail of, of, of say like what Edwards was doing in that slide where we've got all these different type scenes, I mean, you're, you're training it to look for that. And so to that extent, uh, I don't know, it, that's what you're going to find, right? I mean, our, ex our expectations of what constitutes allergy are going to shape the results. As to whether it is universal, I don't, in principle, expect it to be, except in as much as those movies are part of a continuous tradition that goes back to Homer. Um, but there's no need for it to be, in, in my opinion. Coming from the oral formulaic point of view, I think that those type scenes are something that evolved through the oral process. They just happen to stick together as a way of remembering how the poem goes. It's easier to chunk the, these concepts together, right? Like putting on you the greaves and the shield and the helmet. It's just easier to, to, to chunk in your memory as something that always happens together. And I think that that process is what threw those, those things into association. It need not be the same in contemporary you know, Western film, for example. But at the same time, there's a, there's a history there. Does that make sense? Okay, so I don't expect it to be universal, but there's just this caveat that if we look for it, we'll find it. Yes? Well, well you seem to have your specific methods and specific results, but I, and, and then you also talked about close reading again. Uh, I, I would be interested if you, you, so far you see to have found results that would interest a, a traditional commentator on, on texts, for example. Yes, uh, the history of Tesserae is that um, it was basically created coming from the point of view of, of writing a commentary. And some of the people who are using it most extensively that we know about and that, with whom we collaborate the most are, are doing that, are writing commentaries. We're trying to get away from that towards a more general model of, of reading itself, um, but that's, that's part of our makeup at, at the present. Does that address your question, or you'd like to hear more? <laughs> and so uh, we do come from that point of view, and even in this presentation, where I, I try to move a little bit away from that commentator mindset, it's a process of, of zooming out and then coming back around and saying, how, how does the distant reading support a close reading? The project as a whole, the, the big Tesserat project, um, and to a certain extent the, the piece of it that we're doing with the FNS, um, is asking the question of how we read intertextuality, how what we've seen before is interacting in our memory with what we're reading now, why we recognize something, and how we feel about it when we do. But there's this, there's this, there's this history of, of I don't know, of the, of the commentary underneath it. Any more heads? Yeah. Yeah. In the very beginning you talked about the uh, sound similarities between the texts. Yes. Are these features already implemented and uh, we've seen that already or are these ideas for future research? So, in a primitive way, they are. I mean, I can just I can pull it up probably on the on the web, but it has essentially it was kind of implemented and then has not been rigorously tested. There's no one who wants to at this point whose project involves sitting and sifting through the results and measuring the success rate. But it's available um, as a quote feature set. Uh, oh, he just calls it sound now. Sorry, they redid this whole website, but. What it really means is letter trigrams. Um, and there's some interesting research on, for example, like authorship attribution that, that shows how letter character engrams have a really interesting flexibility where they go beyond words and at the same time, um, where they're smaller than words rather, probably more fine grained than words, but at the same time capture a lot of interesting information that you imagine is lexical or syntactic by kind of separating out common endings, common roots those turn out to be the most frequent and character level engrams. And so, you, you know, for example, like uh, with character four grams in Greek, like A-N-D-R is a really common engram. And so you have a sort of lexical s 
effect there, even though you're not telling it anything about the meanings of the words. Likewise, like M-E-N-O-S is a, is a frequent occurrence. And so you're going to get some morphological information out of character level engrams, even though you're not putting it in. But is it tiny? I can try to make it huge. But uh, what you see over here on this, on this side is that these things have been chosen as matching because they share a certain number of three-letter sequences. That's the closest thing we have to sound. If you're interested in meter, which I would, I would put in the same bin, um, musisque deoque can match based on, on metrical similarity, which is really exciting to me. But what we can't do yet is combine these feature sets. We can't say, show me things that are related by lemma and also happen to share a lot of sounds. That's, that's where we're going next, is fusion of different feature sets. The same thing with if we, if we can get it working with this uh, thematic feature. I don't think we're going to be looking at a search that just says, these two passages are both talking about a, a naval voyage, and so they're, they, they constitute an intertext by themselves. Instead, it's going to come in and support other existing similarities at the word level or at the character level. So I would be interested in, in seeing probably alliterations or or lots of plosives in special um, areas of the text that you you can find. I, I worked on that before, and so I thought it's probably uh, yet possible to make um, make it or make it. Or like that. Yeah, it's a dream of mine to go smaller than characters. To first, I, I mean, it's difficult with with ancient languages, but to say we're going to trans translate or transliterate the characters to phonemes and then split those up, say, into distinctive features. Uh, that would be really cool. Uh, have you ever seen work by this guy called Marc Plamondon? He's Canadian, um, and I haven't seen him in years. If you're out there, Marc, I hope, <laughs> I hope you're watching, because uh, I love your work. But he was doing this uh, something similar to that with uh, English poetry, um, where he had classes of sounds. It was not broken down into distinctive features as such, but he would group a set of phonemes and say, these share a, a trait that I'm interested in, essentially a, a distinctive feature. I think he was comparing Tennyson and Browning uh, at the time that I saw him, and he was trying to evaluate whether Tennyson, in some objective sense, sounded nicer <laughs> than Browning, whether he was more mellifluous. Uh, it's really cool. I haven't seen it since. It was like 2010. So if you know anyone who's doing that work, I'd, I'd love to hear about it, and I can, sh I can find you a link to him later. I have a question about your project in, in general, and maybe I missed this part uh, in the beginning. Uh, is it an ongoing project? Uh, is there still an opportunity to go on with your research? And your, your yes. Yeah. Do you want to speak about the FNS about project? The FNS? Yeah. Uh, which, which project? Because Tessera is entering the project of FNS, but the project of the FNS at the beginning was a traditional one. It mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, a, we wanted to, to study the three Flavian epic poets, Francis Silius, and Valerius, uh, and try to, to, to find if the intertextual, the three, the three poets, the three poets, were the same and then it is right to Virgin versus Homer versus Apollonius. Mm -hmm. So it was, we, we work uh, like commentators and uh, we, we try to find uh, verbal correspondences, thematical correspondences, and so on. And uh, then we met <laughs> Chris uh, and the uh, coffee, mm -hmm. uh, and we, we wanted to, yeah, to join uh, them into the project. So this project will continue till uh, next year, uh, 2016. And if it's possible, we, we want to uh, continue because mm -hmm. we are at the beginning with that and with the automatic uh, search. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. so uh, a nice relationship between the yes, projects. yes. Because at, w when we we thought the project, we didn't know uh, the team, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when when we knew them, uh, we have said to ourselves that it was not possible to ignore <laughs> this part of research. Because someone is 
feel him aggressed <laughs> by, uh, by automatic searching, yeah. in a sense, uh, because the commentator say, I'm the only one who has to say it's a good parallel, it's a good allusion, it's not a machine that will say that to me. <laughs> but uh, we have to, to take the problem in, in other yeah. uh, from another point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's, a, it's very important to uh, Mm, yeah, uh, to put uh, together uh, the two types of uh, research, so traditional, uh, mm. working together with, uh, with someone who knows uh, Latin, Greek, uh, informatics, and they can do uh, uh, distant reading uh, that can improve uh, close reading and vice uh, versa. So, so we have just seen a nice example of interdisciplinary yes. teams. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Great. I, I wasn't aware that you you also create interdisciplinary teams. I always saw uh, yeah computer-based uh, linguistics uh, working on their own. So that's that's quite new uh, for me. Yeah. yeah, it was quite new for us too. Interdisciplinarity. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good to know. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, is when you try to find the new features, apart from the features of the authors, do you take into account the similar themes from the beginning? So you know, like, this specific parts are about, I don't know, naked women or uh, travel. And do you take into account that the words will be similar from the beginning, or do you do that? So far, no, but I think we will begin to. I think it will work better if we do make those assumptions, um, or at least we may get results that look more like what we expect initially. Um, the results that you saw so far do not take that into account, um, if, I, if I'm answering your question correctly. So in the first test case, where we were comparing epic and elegy, we decided ahead of time what was an elegy and what was an epic. In the second case, we, to this point, have not decided what the themes should be or even where to look for them. Um, we just cut the text up and tell the computer to organize all the pieces as best it can into groups that are similar. And so for Ovid's Heroides, all the pieces of Ovid's Heroides group together. But for authors like Virgil, Statius, and Valerius Flaccus, you'll find parts of the Aeneid, parts of the Thebaid are more similar to one another than all of the pieces of the Aeneid as a group. Does that make sense? So you're working your way up to it. To yeah. The distinction between the similar themes. That's right. The, 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 what would happen if we got really clear results from the computer without telling it what we were looking for? If we said, find me 10 different clusters in this data, and the computer produced 10 quite different groups of passages shared by all the authors and relatively different from, from one another, then it would be our turn to read those passages and ask ourselves, why are these grouped together? What is it that makes these things similar to one another? In, I mean, the easiest would be if it turned out they were all about sea voyages or they were all about love or, or whatever. But it could be something more complex. Um, it, it's unclear. And because we don't yet have that stability, because we don't yet have a really clear separation among the classes that we ask for, we haven't, we haven't gone any farther than that. Instead, we're starting to now, we've decided essentially to do the separation ourselves at first and then train the computer and see if it can reproduce that. Isn't, isn't it part of, of the uh, so, so the genius of literature that there are illusions that can be worded uh, differently? And I mean, will that not escape when you, you, your, the limitations of your method in the end? I yeah. think uh, some of them surely will right now. We were just talking about this uh, at lunchtime. In fact, one of our goals is to be able to model whatever it is we're doing as readers. This is a lifetime goal. I mean, it's, it's perhaps never going to be achieved. But on the one hand, I can surely tell you there are ways that these authors can be clever. They can hide something there. 
and the reader sees it, and the computer never will, at least not, not as it stands. But doesn't that beg the question, how do we know that? What on earth are we doing that we see it so clearly, and at the same time we can't explain it in rules simple enough for the computer to follow? We can't say, for example, we thought at the, in the dark ages of Tesserae, um, Neil Coffey said, well look, in these commentaries you see all these passages where so-and-so says that these two words you know, are an allusion to Homer because they occur in this place, and you know, there's just a sort of a CF there, right? And you say, oh yeah, that's an illusion. It must be simple to have a computer take all the places where two words together are found in both books and put them in a list and we're done. We've, you know, we've solved it. And instead what happened was we got like 50,000 results, most of which were not interesting. Uh, places where two words are barred from another text or perhaps occur by chance, and it's not significant. And, the next, and that's when we realized that the, the scope of this project had changed completely from saying, let's pull out all these, all these illusions and we're, we can write our commentary, to asking the question, well, if that's, if that's not why it's an illusion. I mean, if, if our commentator says, this is an illusion because these two words are the same, and it turns out that's not why it's an illusion, because if that were the sole sufficient criterion for an illusion, there'd be 20,000 of them. Well, what are the criteria? How did the commentator know that that was an illusion? And he, he rightly excluded all these other false positives. And so now we're looking for all the other features that contribute to making something recognizable and meaningful to readers besides the simple identity of the text. I don't think we're going to achieve it anytime soon. Uh, and there will be ones that, that are just glaringly obvious, but we can't get. Um, perhaps most interesting ones, but at the same time, it's worth, it's worth proceeding, I think. That's my apology for the field. <laughs> yeah? Um, one reason coming here is this wonderful uh, big intertextuality thing you have in your title. Um, so um, ask at the very end how you bind that together. Um, you, you talked about Jeanette somehow, and as far as I understand it, what you're presenting here is an, somehow a counting approach of uh, similarities on a word level, so it's uh, somehow the effective presence of one text inside another, so it's only the subpart of this intertextuality by Jeanette, so this uh, archaic um, hypotextuality yeah. and hypotextuality. It's only these two things we are talking about here. Is that right? The only two things, I don't know if it's the only two things, uh, the idea is uh, as Chris said before, uh, to do this work, uh, push us to, to think what, what is a good uh, kind of a definition of intertextuality. So uh, there are different levels, and uh, one text in another, uh, if it's a, at a verbal point, it's not enough. Uh, and so uh, why we are taking into account other levels. Uh, and try to define intertextuality at different scale. Uh, I think intertextuality, have, uh, I don't know, from zero to, to 10 uh, definition, uh, we can say that intertextuality is quotation because you have uh, the, the word inside, uh, but it's not this intertextuality uh, to, to which we are interested in. It's more the allusion, so with context, so with sound, with uh, uh, yeah, uh, syn synonymous. As, as you said uh, before, uh, it's not because you take the two same words that we are alluding to, to another author. Uh, the author I mean, is free to alluding with uh, two different antonyms, for example, antonymous, or uh, I don't know. We, we, we try to, to, to find every path uh, for the alluding author to another. Uh, to improve uh, our definition of intertextuality. 